So consortium agreements, I don't know how many of you have experience with consortium agreements, how many of you put them together, how, how many of you used the consortium agreement itself. Uh, I suppose the most important first note is that hopefully none of you will be using that. I mean, none of you will be using the legal power that is behind the consortium agreement because you kind of lost the battle if you if you get to that. I know it's a kind of a bad news and starting with that, it's not, not the most positive starting point. But in our experience, the tailored consortium agreement serves you with the smooth management and it serves you to make sure, so to say, that there is enough fear, so to say, from the legal power that the consortium agreement represents within your partnership. And hopefully you will not get to the point that actually you have to go to court because trying to pay maybe a lawyer in Belgium, or maybe you choose another applicable law, then you kind of already lost half of the battle because it's a long process to get some kind of an agreement and maybe you don't really get the result what you want. So I have seen only a really few cases when actually the consortium decided to go to court in Belgium, in Brussels, and then trying to um, solve the conflict. Would it be financial, would it be technical, legal, and so on? The consortium agreement probably in most of the cases will not be used uh, at the court, but it could be used really efficiently to kind of force your partners to do something that is described as a legal obligation in the consortium agreement. Okay, so from the practical management perspective. You might know already that um, these are the uh, consortium agreement templates, so to say. So why should you know these? Anyone who's a legal expert in the field would tell you not to combine, okay, and not to mix up the different articles within the consortium agreement templates. But it is really useful to understand the differences between the consortium agreement templates, how it tries to maybe ease the exploitation of specific results of the project, if you go for more a consortium agreement template that is more in favor of the industrial application, so to say, or any of the other differences between these uh, specific templates would help you to understand how could you tailor more the template that you select for yourself and for your project and for your consortium. So the DESCA is probably that everyone heard about, 85% or maybe even more of the consortia is using the DESCA consortium agreement template. Then there's a big chunk also that is using the M card. This is done by Digital Europe and it's specifically meant for the IT industrial projects because from the past experience, they know that there is a major conflict between the academic organizations and the IT companies, so to say, so the IT industry, how exactly a result could be exploited on the market and what kind of access is given, what is fair and reasonable as a condition and so, so on. So NCARD, the Digital Europe has prepared a more tailored template for the benefit, so to say, of the IT companies that may participate in Horizon 2020 projects. So it is a useful thing to read both of these. Then the EU card is for automotive industry. So something really specific for that industry. So if you put together projects that is related to this one, then maybe you will use this consortium agreement template. And the IMG4, uh, sorry, oh, yes, this automotive industry and IMG4 is for aeronautics industry. That again is something for specific. So within these two, these are kind of based on DESCA, but still more tailored for the, for the needs uh, and the demands of, uh, of these specific industrial sectors. And the LURU is something new, so to say, specific for the Marie Curie's Cloud of Sky actions and also within that, the ITN, ETN actions, so the European Training Network actions. Okay, so if you have such a project, then definitely use the real, real root model, okay, the consortium agreement template because that's really, really useful. It has very specific uh, articles and attachments as well that is specific to your project. But again, most of the projects the collaborative actions in research and innovation field will be using the DESCA. So let's see this one, okay, in more details. The DESCA, if you just checked uh, who are actually within the group uh, who put together the DESCA itself, you already see that many of the different uh, representatives within the research and innovation field were actually participating in the work of putting together the DESCA model. So the DESCA 
had to be flexible enough, had to be simple enough, had to use a language that is understood by the researchers as well, not only the lawyers of the organizations, and it had to fulfill certain requirements also. And this is based on Belgian law, so also some of the specific articles refer to the practices within the Belgian law, such as the good face, for example. Uh, and the desk also has been put together in a way that it has two versions. One is the Word version that um, you can ask in an email, and also the other one is the PDF version, which has explanations. So the articles within the desk also have an explanations and the note, which again helps you to understand what this article refers to and how could you then tailor it to the purposes of your own project. It's a balanced text. It has a modular structure, so you could use between the different modules that the desk offers. Again, already with that, you could tailor a little bit more the consortium agreement template. But also with some specific issues that we will discuss, you should tailor the, the desk. If you sign the desk as it is, even if you choose between the different modules for a simple consortium or a more complex management structure, so to say, it still might not be the most helpful consortium agreement as it is. If you just check maybe some of the recommendations and suggestions, what the consortium agreement should include from the IPR holders perspective, for example, then you will see that already many, many of the things could be there. Also, the desk, for example, does not deal with open access issues, which is now with the open science uh, open innovation and open to the world and, you know, all of these open uh, horizontal priorities of, uh, of the European Commission. This is definitely something that you should deal with. Your project will be definitely handling that. And then also the consortium agreement should be handling that. So again, there are many tasks that you have to uh, have to do with tailoring the consortium agreement itself. But again, the desk is the perfect starting point for that. Then, um, sorry, my slide, let's see. I'm trying to click on the next, but it doesn't work. So I'm not able to change the slide. Good. Okay, so. Okay, I will start and I will start sharing again. Okay. Now it's going to work quite well. Okay, so the structure of the desk. Um, I don't want to bore you with a lot of theoretical information regarding the desk. The structure I included because the next line will try to compare the structure of the grant agreement and the structure of the consortium agreement. The grant agreement is there to protect the interest of the European Union citizens, right? Or so to say the interest of the European Commission. The consortium agreement, on the other hand, should protect the project itself. Okay, that's the main purpose of that. It should consider all of the interests of the individual partner organizations. Okay, and it should also make sure that the project can be implemented smoothly. So, if you compare the structure of the grant agreement 